You'll never see it uttered by Michael Smirkanish. You'll never see it talked about on CNN. But I asked Ryan, why is there no mention of the money that these people are legally taking bribes? It just seems to me at this point, it is just so absurd that the media is reporting about Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema like moderates. They just, you know, they're they're just dealing with a conservative state. I haven't, I barely heard anything that Cinema just raised almost a million dollars from big pharma and dark money. I think David Sirota and others broke that. Uh, you, Intercept just broke a pretty big story that Manchin has made 4.5 million from this coal company while he's been a senator. I think another whatever, between 1 million and 5 million in stock options. Like this isn't like a little finger, like a little uh, finger note in the story. This is instrumental to why is it they are blocking this? And you see no mention of this. Uh, I think you guys also covered the fact that three House Democrats, I, I just call them Republicans, they're they're blocking the lower uh, lowering drug prices and they're getting all this money, like not over their career, like right now, so I don't know. You're a reporter there. Uh, is this just like, do the, do the people at CNN and MSNBC just think this is unimportant or it's designed not to talk about those things? Mainstream reporters think it's rude. No, like it's, they, think it's, they think it's impolite. It's untoward. To, to talk, talk about, about money in politics. That sort of thing. Because it, you're besmirching somebody's good character. What are you, what are you suggesting? You want to know who Nancy Pelosi really is? This was from back when 60 Minutes still would do a real report once in a while before they started uh, having Fo ex Fox News producers run their show. <laughs> Here, here's, here's 60 Minutes. Watch this. It's but one more example of good things happening to powerful members of Congress. Another is the access to initial public stock offerings, the opportunity to buy a new stock at insider prices just as it goes on the market. They can be incredibly lucrative and hard to get. If you were a senator, Steve, and I gave you $10,000 cash, one or both of us is probably gonna go to jail. But if I'm a corporate executive and you're a senator and I give you IPO shares in stock, and over the course of one day, that stock nets you $100,000, that's completely legal. And former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and her husband had participated in at least eight IPOs. One of those came in 2008 from Visa, just as a troublesome piece of legislation that would have hurt credit card companies began making its way through the House. Undisturbed by a potential conflict of interest, the Pelosi's purchased 5,000 shares of Visa at the initial price of $44. Two days later, it was trading at 64. The credit card legislation never made it to the floor of the House. Congresswoman Pelosi also declined our request for an interview, but agreed to call on us if we attended her news conference. Madam Leader, um, I wanted to ask you why you and your husband back in March of 2008 um, accepted and participated in a very large IPO deal from Visa. At a time there was major uh, legislation affecting their credit card companies making its way through the, um, through the House. And well, did you consider that to be a conflict of interest? The, I, I don't know what your point is of your question. Well, my point is that you're a criminal. Senators Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin spoke before the National Restaurant Association, and that's of course the lobbying group that has been the most aggressive in squashing a federal minimum wage hike to $15 an hour. Now, we do have some video of Senator Sinema's statements and speech during this event, and this is exactly what it looks like when you've been bought off by business interests. Take a look. There's a bill that passed the House, the PRO Act, uh, Give us a sense as this bill makes its way to the Senate, where you uh, intend to be on this. We know it's an evolving issue. And if you'd be willing to have a, a discussion with employers in Arizona about our concerns about this bill being a disruption to the workplace and to our business environment. Well, I would welcome such a discussion. As folks who are listening today know, the way I make decisions on behalf of Arizona and for our constituents is by listening to the business leaders who will be impacted by these decisions. I can tell you that many Arizona businesses have already reached out to my office and I know have discussed the concerns that they have with the PRO Act with some of the folks who are on our call today. We are watching carefully because some of the PRO Act provisions, especially in regards to the worker classification test for independent contractors, could 
become a part of other legislative ideas. So I would ask all the members who are joining us today to please stay involved with my office and help me by sharing information about how this would impact you and your company so that I can go back to Senate uh, leadership and folks on both sides of the aisle to discuss the concerns that Arizona businesses have. That's it's incredible. Businesses, please just reach out to me. Please call me, please. I, I want to hear what you have to say and then I'll go back to the Senate and I'll do exactly what you're paying me to do. Please do it, please. I used to support a $15 an hour minimum wage, but then I changed my mind once I realized that corruption feels so, so good. So, so good. Yeah, now remember, that's the same senator who wore a ring that said F off. That's right. To her critics, i.e. her voters. So the voters F off. To the business interest, I'm listening. The way I make decisions is that I listen to business leaders and then I do whatever they tell me to do. I mean, she, she just said, said it. the first half of that, she, she said, said it. it. You can rewatch it. She also said, uh, uh, now, how you could be really helpful is by sharing information. Let me translate for you guys by sharing checks. Mm. This is not complicated code words. She's speaking to business leaders. And and they want a lower minimum wage. They don't want the pro act. And and so she's saying, if you share with my office, uh, you know that will help me make my decision. Hey, look, Nancy Pelosi. Turns out she's corrupt. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband cashed in on big tech just as Congress was set to pounce. Huh? huh? What? Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband gained nearly five million dollars on stock trades at Google's parent company Alphabet. This is amazing. Pelosi also add, added bets to Amazon and Apple ahead of the House Judiciary Committee's vote last month to advance five antitrust bills targeting major tech giants. Paul Pelosi, who owns real estate and venture capital investment firms, exercised four, exercised 40 call options to gain 4,000 shares of Alphabet at a strike price of $1,200. Pelosi gained $4.8 million from that trade, which has since risen to $5.3 million, Bloomberg reported. When reached for comment on Paul Pelosi's recent financial moves, Pelosi spokesman says Nancy Pelosi has no involvement or prior knowledge of these transactions, of adding that the speaker does not own any stock. Mm. <laughs> Pelosi spoke to reporters last month saying there has been concern on both sides of the aisle about the consolidation of power of tech companies and the interests of meeting needs of people whose privacy and data and all the rest is at the mercy of these tech companies. In case you missed it, recent financial disclosures show Speaker Nancy Pelosi and her husband Paul purchased up to $10 million in Microsoft stock in early March. These purchases came just weeks before the Pentagon announced a $22 billion contract with the tech giant for AR headsets. This is awesome. Microsoft wins U.S. Army contract for augmented reality headsets worth up to $21 billion over 10 years. Hey, here's from Open Secret. Nancy Pelosi... Uh, maximum net worth two hundred forty-two million dollars. I watched the talk you did with Willie Leggett on on South Carolina, and I'm wondering: oh, yeah. is there any chance that Willie Leggett will primary Jim Clyburn? It's yeah. funny you mention that because he just ran for a, a state house seat in um, Orangeburg, R running uh, against Clyburn in, in a campaign is a suicide mission. Willie, by the way, has known Jamie Harrison since Upton Harrison was a kid. And he said that Harrison was always had his eye on the main chance and his lips pursed to find the right ass. And, and he <laughs> uh, and like, he's like everybody else in South Carolina uh, or like every other black Democrat with aspirations is hoping that close enough to, Hyber, uh, to Clyburn to be tapped as his uh, you know, successor. He's unbeatable. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. he's the most progressive, as he said the other yeah. day about himself. I wonder if you saw that. There ain't nobody in the Democratic Party of the United States of America that's more progressive than Jim Clyburn. Nobody. When Clyburn finally stopped being coy and announced his support for Biden, he actually said that as far as he was concerned, the race was between Biden and Medicare for all. So that's just kind of <laughs> He's like the biggest recipient of pharmaceutical. He is. Yeah. Right.
Right, over a million dollars in 10 years. And that buys a lot of you know, political clout in the state of South Carolina. He's, see, I'm asking something else about the electoral stuff. Resources in m- most electoral contests will, will, will be no resources, right? Uh, yep. m- most of the time. And another practice that the Democrats seem to have fallen into in their general kind of American Idol approach to like electoral policy. So, I mean, like last time we had like Beto and Stacey Abrams who created this new category called the almost victor, right? So you find um, an improbable candidate to run against and um, a very probable um, kind of Republican opposition raise a shitload of money. And this was the same same, same thing, th- th- thing happened with Jamie this time. But, but, but they raise $100 million and almost win. And then what happens is the almost victor uh, gets to follow a new career path as like a kingmaker w- within the party. Beto kind of faltered because his white chocolate Obama act wasn't as <laughs> as, as Mayor Pete's white white chocolate Obama act. Uh, so I don't know what the hell I'm, he's doing now. And like, I, no, I mean, follow the money. I mean, we all know that. Look, I mean, so for Gavin Newsom in California to come out and give a special pass to prison guards of all people, prison guards. Why? Because you don't want to uh, you don't want to uh, uh, disrupt the flow of prison labor. Right. Because capitalism now has slavery and it's actually more profitable than slavery, because if you're a slave owner, you have to pay for the medical care and the room and board of your slaves. Well, guess what? Corporations don't have to do that now. The state of California does that with prisoners. They take care of all their medical care. They take care of their room and board. So you don't have to pay. It's more It's more profitable than slavery right now to have prison labor. And that's why Governor Newsom, so he's got all those pressures. He's got the prison guards who give him money, and he's got the capitalists uh, who want to keep that prison labor going. This is the world we're living in. And isn't this the reason, like, the reason for the recall for Gavin Newsom, wasn't that because he went to a restaurant when he locked the state down and he went to a restaurant and – had like this private dinner without like a mask on or something like that. He wasn't abiding by the rules himself. Not only did he did he tell everybody you got to wear a mask and you can't congregate indoors. Not only did he do that, he then went to a not only a restaurant. He went to probably the most expensive restaurant in the world, the French Laundry, and he was having dinner without his mask, surrounded by people without their masks. And guess who he was who was seated on his right and left shoulder. There was a health insurance lobbyist and there was another health insurance lobbyist on both sides of them. So that's who Gavin Newsom is. And now you wonder why people are skeptical of power when they tell them that they have to be mandated to take a coerced medical procedure. Why would you ever trust Gavin Newsom? You're going to trust Joe Biden? You're going to, I'm never going to trust the government uh, on this. No, I'm going to do my own research. And uh, they're willing to be paid off and bought out. We all know they are. Uh, two people from the FDA just resigned. The person in charge of vaccines resigned from, from the FDA because Joe Biden, who's a, a corporate whore and takes all the money that he can from Wall Street, Big Pharma and the military industrial complex, was pushing the third booster before the FDA said we should. And they over politicized it. Who did it? Joe Biden. And so the person in charge of vaccines at the FDA resigned in protest. And we're still supposed to trust Joe Biden. Get out of here. Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema has emerged as one of Big Pharma's most loyal beneficiaries as the Arizona Senator continues to block her own party's plan to allow Medicare to negotiate significantly lower prescription drug prices. But not too long ago, Sinema sang a different song to the people of Arizona. Growing up, our family struggled to make ends meet, and we didn't have health insurance. No child should go without a doctor, and no family should be bankrupted by medical bills. We need to make health care more affordable, with access to the lowest cost prescriptions, and fix what's broken in the system, not go back to when Arizonans had no say about their health coverage. I'm Kirsten Cinema. I sponsor this message because every American deserves quality, affordable health care. Uh, she's ta- so talk a little bit about the uh, amount of money that cinema has taken from the, the pharmaceutical industry and whether you think or what role you think that's playing here. 
Well, Ryan, it's it's inscrutable if the thing that you just refuse to look at is the mountain of cash uh, <laughs> that you're you're in the shadow of, uh, the mountain of campaign <laughs> cash, right? I mean, yes, then I and it's hard to know why Kirsten Cinema is behaving this way, uh, but Kirsten Cinema uh, has taken lots and lots of money from the various interests that don't want the reconciliation bill to pass in general, and specifically that don't want these uh, uh, prescription drug provisions uh, to pass. Uh, so. Kirsten Cinema has taken, uh, depending on how you count it, somewhere between a half a million dollars and seven hundred fifty thousand dollars from various pharmaceutical and related interests that do not like the idea of Medicare negotiating lower prescription drug prices. Uh, she campaigned, as you just showed, she campaigned uh, uh, to in pr with a promise to lower prescription drug prices. This is uh, her stance is an obvious betrayal of that. I mean, I was laughing because the ad now seems, in context and in retrospect, sort of like an SNL satire. <laughs> like, wow, you just like went out there and said that and now you're doing the exact opposite kind of thing. The reason why I constantly uh, talk about how important the media is and how much they fail at their jobs and why that matters so much is when Krista Cinema did the theatrical sums down on the minimum wage and because of that, the media covered a, her voting against higher wages, do you know that her Polling in Arizona dropped from 65 to 50. Oof. She lost. I didn't 50. know that. Jake. She lost 15 points when when the media just covered a shade of how awful she is. Right now, imagine if the national media told you about their campaign contributions nonstop. Imagine if they showed you that video all the time. You know how much of a different her poll numbers would be five percent. Mm -hmm. They'd be lower than the minimum wage we're trying to fight for. Okay, and so her and Manchin would be devastated if the American people actually knew what they were about. But the national media is in the power protection racket, so that's why you need people like us and again other progressive outlets to tell you the reality of who Kirsten Cinema is. She pretty much just told you right there in that video. And one more thing, Anna. She, that looked like a hostage video. Yeah, it, did. it looked like it was the Hunger Games and the corporate overlords from the Capitol. Tell them, tell them, right? Tell them what we told you to tell them. Yeah, tell like they're right like, now. okay, a lot of up, up against right the wall, now. up against the brick wall. Now go, go. You want checks? Dance. And and cinema was like, yes, I listen to you guys. Mm -hmm. I will take your mm -hmm. directions, corporate yes. overlords. Yes, I will yes, do it. Right away, I will do sir. anything you say. Yes, sir. absolutely. Uh, so uh, apparently, relatively easy uh, to. Convince these uh, captives uh, of the corporations simply with incentives and disincentives, yeah. i.e., money. New reporting from ProPublica further entrenches the consulting firm McKinsey in questionable dealings with Big Pharma. Despite offering upwards of $50 million in consulting services to the FDA since 2008, McKinsey reportedly never disclosed their contracts with lucrative pharmaceutical corporations, including Purdue Pharma and Johnson & Johnson, with the government. This means that as McKinsey advised Big Pharma on how to evade FDA oversight, they worked simultaneously to shape FDA drug policy. We want to note that McKinsey's ties with the pharmaceutical industry were revealed to the public in 2019. However, this reporting shows the consulting firm neglected to ever alert the FDA of their massive conflict of interest for over a decade before that. I mean, it's a huge concern, right, that, that, that this, that this mm -hmm. consulting firm is involved in both ends of the process. I mean, we talk about the revolving lobbyist door, right? You can, yeah. be, in the, you can be in the government writing the rules and then immediately go into the private sector and, and you know, start ad advising firms on how to beat those rules. Right. And if you're McKinsey, you can do both at the exact same time. Right. And this actually opens up a nice uh, ripe terrain for future journalistic inquiry because McKinsey's probably doing this all over the place right where they're where they're working on both sides of an issue and they'll and maybe they would say internally they would say well we have a Chinese wall between this particular team and this particular team but in this case as they say the contract requires that you that you disclose that you're doing this the the regulation around opioids is is particularly frustrating and interesting in, in its in its history in the sense that at the same time that the U.S. was waging this uh, aggressive war on drugs and, and war on people, really, who were doing drugs, right. uh, the DEA, uh, in, in particular, was rapidly and, and annually increasing the amount of opioids that these drug makers were allowed to distribute around the country. 
Well, and, and certainly, certainly a lobbyist firm representing both sides of the process at the right. same time <laughs> to to compel the government to set the limits at whatever the company wants is not good. <laughs> right, right, and and even as they're seeing. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of pills, you know, go into a single pharmacy in, say, West Virginia uh, when there are a thousand people who live, you know, within 10 miles of that pharmacy. You're like, well, hmm, right. how's this happening? Right. So the, the, the DEA, uh, which, you know, has a massive, massive budget and all of the, 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 the clever surveillance tools that they've been able to develop over the years, can't figure out that a that a pharmacy in in West Virginia is is selling you know 100,000 times the number of pills than it, than the number of residents who live near it like come on DEA well, the, the for kids and adults suffering severe allergies a single peanut or a single garden bee sting can be pre fatal. That's why millions of Americans, including my sister, they rely on EpiPens. They shoot life-saving drug epinephrine into the body that can make a difference between life and death if there's a severe allergic outbreak. Now, these pens, which are almost all manufactured by the same company, Mylan Pharmaceuticals, have skyrocketed in price. A pair used to cost about $100. That's just seven years ago in 2009. Now they are setting families back as much as $600. This massive price hike has prompted several lawmakers to call for an investigation. That segment was published on August 24th, 2016. And the individual responsible for that price hike is Heather Reich, the CEO of Milan. Now, this individual isn't just the CEO of Milan. She also happens to be the daughter of Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia. Now, at the time when this news broke, Joe Manchin actually had the audacity to defend his daughter and claim that contrary to to what you're seeing, she's actually really compassionate. He said, my daughter is my daughter with unconditional love and she's the most amazing person that I know. He continued, she's so compassionate and generous and how she's always lived her life. Yeah, doesn't really seem like it. The former West Virginia governor said that ever since Bresch has been at Milan and he's been in politics, we made a point to keep those parts of our lives separate. Except everything that he said there is literally backwards. His daughter is not compassionate because if she were compassionate, she wouldn't have hiked up the price of this life-saving drug. People may die because of what she did. We don't have the numbers. It hasn't been quantified to my knowledge, but what she did, she knew how catastrophic that could be, but she did it anyway because she wanted to increase profits for her company. And he says that, you know, when it comes to her life as the CEO of Milan and my life in politics, we try to keep those things separate. Except that's not the case because executives at Milan donated a combined $180,000 to Joe Manchin. So it's not separate. There's a conflict of interest. He's representing them as a donor and also because... This is his daughter. Now, in 2018, after he said that in 2016, he was asked about this during a, debates, uh, a debate between him and his Republican opponent. And as you're going to see, uh, he totally sidestepped the question, refused to answer. Senator Manchin, 2016, Milan Pharmaceuticals became embroiled in a controversy after the cost of the life-saving EpiPen had shot up 500% in just a few years. Your daughter, Heather Bresch, Milan's CEO, was grilled on Capitol Hill for that price spike. You defended her and said the attacks on her salary of $19 million were quote-unquote sensational. Records show Milan employees and executives have contributed over $180,000 to your campaign. You also said the real problem was the convoluted system that drove up the price. Why, Senator, was Manchin justified? Why was Milan justified in charging $600 for a two-pack of life-saving drugs that cost about $20 to $30 to make? First of all, Hoppy, the system is broken. It has been broken. Patrick Morrissey helped break it because he profits more from it being broken than fixing it. Next of all, I can't tell you on a publicly traded company how they are. Yeah, very, very convincing, Senator Manchin. Very, very convincing. Speaking of Big Pharma, David, you also reported that Big Pharma bankrolled local disease-based foundations, and now those foundations are sponsoring ads thanking corporate Democrats for killing legislation to lower the price of medicine, including Congresswoman Kathleen Rice and Congressman Scott Peters. Tell us about that reporting. Oh, this is this is just it's so depressing. Uh, there are various local foundations out there in states and cities uh, that represent uh, or purport to represent patients uh, with specific diseases. The Lupus Foundation is one example. Uh, a lot of these foundations get money from pharma. 
pharma, the Washington-based lobby group uh, that lobbies for the pharmaceutical industry's interest in Washington. And what we've seen is that the specific Democrats uh, who have voted against their own party's promise bill uh, provisions in the reconciliation bill to allow Medicare to negotiate lower prices for drugs, those specific legislators are now being thanked by some of these local disease-branded, disease-based patient advocacy groups, thanked for their work on prescription drug uh, reform. Uh, so it's totally dishonest. It's It seems super corrupt. And by the way, it's super shrewd, though, right? I mean, Pharma really has weaponized this kind of local stealth network uh, to boost members of Congress who are doing the bidding of the industry. And it's really Orwellian, right? I mean, you're specifically thanking the members who are killing this bill, these, these ads are thanking these members who are killing this bill for supposedly helping patients afford prescription drugs. It, it's, it's really, really gross, but again, it is really shrewd. It shows the kind of hardball tactics that, that pharma uh, brings to the table and why pharma is such a powerful in, in interest in Washington. Mm. Yeah, weaponizing the Lupus Foundation to keep drug prices high is about as dark as it can get. They, <laughs> yeah. they, the deal between Pfizer and Mylan led the former to withdraw its competitor from the market and partner with Mylan on EpiPen, locking down Monopoly. Following, a deal, following the deal with Pfizer, Mylan drove the price above $600 within five years. Meanwhile, Gail Manchin, Bresch's mother, lobbied states to require schools to stock epinephrine as the head of the National Association of State Boards of Education. Gail Manchin was recently confirmed to serve as co-chair of the Federal Appalachian Regional Commission, which is a government agency tasked with promoting economic development across the region's 13 states. The email sent on behalf of Bresch by her assistant includes the subject line, Our Discussion. She writes, quote, I'm sending you this email as a reminder that you were to send me confirmation relative to our discussion regarding EpiPen. In that discussion, you indicated that you would be divesting your Adrenoclick product once the Pfizer King deal closes. I understand your tender offer is closing today, so I would appreciate receiving your response as soon as possible. Now, I'm not a lawyer. But I would bet there isn't a lawyer alive who'd tell their client it was a good idea to put something like that in writing. Cutting a deal with Pfizer to divest from its competitor may be brazen enough, but to memorialize the agreement in an email produces a startling window into the ways in which corporate executives are able to manipulate markets. How do they get around? How do they get around pay, making people work seventy-hour weeks, twenty? Hour, I heard it, in the story I read about it said that they didn't give people lunch breaks and stuff like that. And then part of their negotiation with the union is, oh, we'll take away our fines for not giving you guys lunch breaks. Like they'll do. You, they're so skeezy. So um, it's about time, and uh, uh, you know we need to. Uh, we need a massive uprising of labor in this country. Uh, that, again, it's not that we don't have the wealth in this country. As Jack Ma, who, who told us, we don't spread our money around, right? We're the, it, it, what happened during COVID, income, income inequality got even greater. We took $5 trillion that Bernie Sanders and the squad voted for, $5 trillion and gave it to the richest people in the country, not the poorest. We gave it to the richest people in the country. So as FDR approved, they should have taken at least a trillion of that and put it in people's pockets. They didn't. They won't even give you a two thousand dollar check. So we have uh, uh, this. The 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 culture doesn't work for the people anymore, for the workers. And so you're you're going to see stuff like this. I'm glad. That's how bad it's gotten. That and they can see their companies are making all that money now. Here's why those people can get away with all that. They donate, right? The movie companies and the banks that finance the movies donate to the politicians, so they own them. And that's how they get to do stuff like that. Like when Governor Newsom said we couldn't have restaurants, even outside restaurants because of COVID. And then you saw the video where right across the street from an outside restaurant, there was a movie production that had rows and rows and rows of tables set up for lunch. And they get to do that. Why? Because they're donators to the governor and the Democrats. And, and uh, uh, their bank, the bank that financed that movie also is. There you go. Manchin got asked yesterday about his coal company. Uh, for the first time, really, by a, a Capitol Hill uh, reporter. Uh, and it was a really tense exchange. Um, the mansion said, look, it's, it's in a blind trust, which is absurd. Um, it's a company. Just like, just like Trump's like, money was in a blind trust. Right. It's, it's still a Trump organization. Like, you know what you own. It's not like a mutual right. fund 
that you're and and you're just allowing your broker to like buy and sell stocks like it's a coal company like we you know what it does and the, and the reporter said well you still get dividends from it and mansions like said i don't want to hear you know what i don't want to hear anything about it and, and the reporter said well your son still owns it right he's the president and ceo and uh mansion told him you best you best change the subject wow like just straight up bet you best change the subject uh so he's so basically he's, the five hundred thousand pound elephant in the room if they dare bring it up they're they're scolded and basically they're afraid for loss of access i would assume she's doing pretty good she's the that's the leader of the people's house and that's from 2018. yeah that's from 2018. Uh, Pelosi's husband gained nearly $5 million on Alphabet stock ahead of the v vote to advance uh, five antitrust bills. Me? I wouldn't vote for her. Yeah, me neither. But the squad did. Every one of them. First vote they cast every year is for Nancy Pelosi. Here it is. Pelosi. Ocasio-Cortez. Pelosi. Olsen. That was her voting for Nancy Pelosi, all dressed in white, and then giggling about it afterwards. We just screwed workers. <laughs> We're just screwed work. We just propped up Wall Street. <laughs> we just propped up the military industrial complex. Isn't that funny? I didn't do what I said I was going to do. Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? McCarthy. She's giddy. She couldn't be happier. She just sold out every person who worked on her campaign. But to be clear, you're not taking any arrows out of your quiver. You're not ruling anything out. Good morning. Sunday morning. The, uh, the, the, we have a responsibility. We take an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. You can't get rich in politics unless you're a crook. So Nancy Pelosi, according to Harry Truman, is a big crook because she became a hundred millionaire while she was in politics, and she is a big crook. There, I said it. Nancy Pelosi is a corrupt crook. And I'm using the actual definition of corrupt, not the invented one that Kyle made for the squad. There is this mis misleadership class that, you know, the, 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 the Jim Clyburn to the world are they have, they have an enormous amount of power arguably jim clyburn won the election for for joe biden and I'm, I'm glad you brought him up he continues to be this toxic influence which only recently gets any pushback from the mainstream media in part because he is able to use the protection of identity and the legacy of being you know a civil rights icon and all of these things i wanted to play a clip um, of a recent back and forth that he had with Mehdi Hassan on, on his show. You have been quite critical of the left, of your party. The Democrats lost a net dozen House seats last November. Despite winning the White House, you've been very critical of the party's progressive wing for, quote, sloganeering, you say, with movements like Medicare for All and defund the police. And that the bigger problem was that many voters didn't have a clear grasp of what the Democratic Party stood for. So. Is the whole attention on defund the police really a deflection by the party leadership from your own failures? That's what your critics on the left would say. That is absolutely poppycock. I know what I'm talking about. Defund the police is a non-starter even with black people. And if you don't think that's true, then look at the results of what just happened in New York City's election. If you're going to categorize left and right, I'm on the left of my party. Nobody can call me anything but a progressive. And been one all of my life. Met my wife in jail. I'd like to know how much the big pharma checks he's catching. I was just going to say, his biggest funders, <laughs> Jim Clyburn's biggest funders, are literally the, the pharmaceuticals, insurance, and healthcare industries are his Jim biggest funders. Jim Clyburn is the, is the epitome of what we at Black Agenda Report have called the black misleadership class, or what I call the black political class. He is a big pharma paid stooge, and his whole purpose is to leverage the South Carolina primary to make sure that whoever the 
backers and funders of the Democratic Party, financial services, insurance companies, real estate developers, the military industrial complex, whoever they are, which is who the Democratic Party actually responds to, that that's the person that wins the South Carolina primary. He is the most egregious example of what, everything that is wrong with black politics, and he's the last person that anyone should take seriously. Um, so I wanted to play that Ryan Grimm clip because then let's fast forward to the brave Bloomberg reporter. I mean, that's an oxymoron. Colin, if you have those tweets, a reporter from Bloomberg actually dared to ask Joe, uh, Joe Manchin about the money that he is making from coal and whether that's influencing things. And boy, was that a no-no for a reporter to ask Joe, dare ask Joe Manchin about the blinking red light corruption as to why he is blocking health care, education, affordable housing, climate proposals, free community college, and many other things. Colin, if you could show that tweet here. So uh, Manchin asked by Ari Natter of Bloomberg whether an energy company he founded, um, whether an energy company company he founded is a conflict of interest as he negotiates reconciliation. Manchin, I've been, it's been in a blind trust for 20 years. I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, it's, my son owns it now. My son runs it. I don't know what they're doing though. Ari, uh, you're still getting dividends. Manchin, you got a problem? What is this, a duel? Uh, you got the next one, Colin? So the reporter asked them, uh, is you being making millions and millions of dollars from your coal company have anything to do with you trying to kill climate provisions? He says, oh, I don't know anything about that. Oh, you got a problem? Uh, Ari Nader, regarding the energy company Manchin founded, your son still owns it, doesn't he? Manchin, you do best to change the subject. You do best to change the subject, meaning that could mean a lot of things. Uh, I don't believe Manchin is going to hit the Bloomberg reporter over the head with a two by four. Uh, I don't believe that, but will he be calling Bloomberg to shun this reporter for daring to ask him about his clear, it's not even a conflict of interest. This is corruption. You are literally, Intercept broke this. Joe, Joe Manchin has made $4.5 million over 10 years as a senator from this coal company and another, another one to $5 million in stock options. Yet, He's talking about, well, no, it's just it's just about the debt. We can't do this bill. Oh, it's just about, you know, fiscal insanity. We can't do this bill. The infrastructure deal, this bipartisan infrastructure deal that the media has like made into this magical thing. It's really five hundred billion dollars. It's not one point two trillion. And it's really privatization on steroids. It's not even at all close to what we need financially for infrastructure in this country. But that got watered down from two trillion to five hundred billions in new in new money by Mansion and Cinema and these other people. And what got stripped? What got taken out, Jen? The climate proposals that were in it. So there you see Ryan Grimm takes us behind the scenes, saying, "Yeah, no, it's considered rude. You're not considered a serious journalist if you dare dare mention the legal bribes that they're taking." And then a reporter dares ask, dares ask Joe Mansion. And by the way, he was only asking directly about his coal company. He wasn't asking about all the money he takes from other coal companies and fossil fuckers. Uh, and that reporter sure got a lashing. And this is why I've said, Jen, this is why older people who generally vote generally are the dominant age group watching CNN, MSNBC, reading the New York Times, Washington Post. This is why they're brainwashed. This is why they're complacent. This is why they continually vote for, well, it's better than nothing candidates. And, ex, you know, enjoy your crumbs, gen, uh, millennials and generate gen, gen Z or whatever the hell it is, uh, mm -hmm. because there is no reporting on the corruption, barely any reporting on the corruption. I'm not a big, you know, we're not copacetic these days. But one of the reasons I gravitated to Jank and the Young Turks in the first place, back then, they were the only people talking about this. They were only only people talking about money in politics and corruption in politics. And that's what that's the look Nancy Pelosi gives when she's being called out for her criminal behavior. And that's when when she's lying. That's her lying face. I uh, I don't I, I, uh, I don't know what you're talking. Uh, and is there some point that you want to make with that? 
Well, I, I guess what I'm asking is, do you think it's all right for uh, a speaker uh, to accept uh, a very preferential and favorable uh, stock deal? Well, we didn't. And you participated in the IPO. Well, I had many And at the time you were Speaker of the House. You don't think it was a conflict of interest or had the appearance no, of a it, conflict not, of interest? No, it only has the appearance if you decide that you're going to have a, a, a elaborate on a false premise. But it, it, it's not true, and that's that. I don't understand what part's yeah. not true. Yes, sir. Um, that I, that I would you. act upon an investment. Yes, sir. Congresswoman Pelosi pointed out that the tough credit card legislation eventually... So there you go. There's your sociopathic criminal, Nancy Pelosi, became a hundred millionaire while she's been in Congress. She's part, she is uh, uh, complicit in war crimes, which is why George Bush and all the people who ordered torture were never prosecuted because she was the person who was supposed to do it. And Julian Assange revealed she was complicit in war crimes in the torture. And that's why they want to kill Julian Assange, because he turns the, up the dirt on all these people. He exposes all their war crimes. That's why they want to kill Chelsea Manning. He exposes their war crimes. She, she exposes their war crimes. Quite a, quite a video, huh? About her, you know, you thought it was just a few senators who did that with the coronavirus when they got the inside information. Then they stole all, sold all that stock and bought other stock. Nothing happened to any of those people. Nothing happened, nothing happened to her. Not, they're all criminal. Do you think that she's less criminal than Trump? She is not. And she is, you know who's the happiest person in the country that we have, Trump? Nancy Pelosi. Because she could go, look at that. Look at the village idiot. Look at he said something stupid about bleach. Look, he said something else stupid. Look over there. Don't look at what I'm doing. Don't look at how I'm screwing you as hard as Mitch McConnell could ever screw you. That's your female Mitch McConnell. 